Good morning and good afternoon. This is uh, David Schilling from the Interface Center on Corporate Responsibility and the Investor Alliance uh, for Human Rights, uh, welcoming you to Safeguarding Human Rights Defenders Practical Guidance for Investors. Uh, this report came out in April uh, by the staff of the uh, Investor Alliance, along with the Business and Human Rights Resource Center and the International Service for Human Rights. And we have representatives on this uh, webinar uh, from those organizations. Uh, the report is really critical, not only in terms of the content related to uh, the, the importance of frontline human rights defenders, but it also is really saying to the investor community that there are some real responsibilities here that need to get incorporated into uh, you know, investment processes. And we'll be talking about that uh, throughout, the, uh, throughout the webinar. But we really want to start with getting a full you know, kind of picture of you know, what's, what's the scale and the uh, nature of attacks uh, faced by human rights defenders. And then what are the responsibilities of companies, of investors? Uh, how do we understand the business case for protecting uh, human rights defenders? And then a little bit about the practical guidance, which we'll um, be able to talk about later. So before we uh, go into the content, just a few uh, points about logistics. Uh, the first is that we'll, we're recording this webinar and the recording of the webinar will be available to all of the uh, registrants shortly after the webinar. And the second is that you are all muted at the time right now, but you will have an opportunity to ask questions uh, at later in the, in the webinar. Uh, and you will be able to virtually raise your hand or simply put a question into the uh, question box and we'll try to get into as many as possible. So we'll hold questions until uh, later in the webinar after our panelists uh, have spoken. So we are going to start with uh, Kristen Dobson from the Business Human Rights Resource Center. Uh, the Resource Center has played such a significant role here in undergirding not only the understanding of, but the real defense of human rights uh, defenders. So Kristen, uh, get us started. Uh, and we're delighted to have you here uh, representing the amazing uh, organization that you're a part of. Uh, the Business Human Rights Resource Center. Uh, thanks so much. Thank you, David, and hello, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here with you today to discuss this really critical topic. As David mentioned, I work at the Business and Human Rights Resource Center, and we are focused on the protection of human rights defenders and civic freedoms in two main ways. The first is to really support and amplify the work on human rights defenders that are focused on business-related activities, and we also work to increase action and longer-term investment of businesses in support of human rights defenders and civic freedoms. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So when we talk about human rights defenders, we're referring to someone who alone or with others acts to promote and protect human rights. Human rights defenders can be individuals, organizations, or communities that are working peacefully to uphold and advance rights. They're really those that are at the forefront of protecting our rights and shared planet. And this can include workers that are protesting for safer working conditions and access to protective equipment, indigenous communities voicing opposition to a pipeline they didn't give consent for, defending their access to clean water, journalists that are highlighting links of corruption between the state and companies, or union leaders as just a few examples. Human rights defenders are also vital in helping businesses and investors identify and manage risks to people in their operations and value chains. And yet we increasingly see attacks against human rights defenders related to their work to push for responsible business and investment. And we've seen these attacks continue during the COVID-19 pandemic and COVID-19 actually exacerbating the risks 
um, that human rights defenders face, as well as the risks to civic freedoms that enable their work. At the Resource Center, along with Defending Land and Environmental Defenders Coalition, Forum Asia, and a number of our partners, we've been looking at how um, attacks against defenders have changed or what the trends are during the pandemic. We've seen that laws are being used to intimidate and harass defenders using the pandemic as an excuse to pass new controversial or restrictive laws. Um, government restrictions such as curfews have made it more difficult to exercise freedom of association and expression, um, more challenging for unions to organize against abuse. We've seen that these restrictions on freedom of assembly have been used to arrest labor and environmental rights defenders in Malaysia, in Russia, and a number of other countries. And we've also seen a suspension of labor and environmental regulations in several countries in the name of attracting more investment. And these being used to crack down on landed environmental defenders that might be resisting uh, these, these activities or pushing for more responsible practices. Next slide. Um, so when we think about the state of attacks against human rights defenders, at the Resource Center, we've been tracking attacks since 2015, specifically on defenders focused on business-related activities. And unfortunately, since that time, we've tracked nearly 2,400 attacks against defenders, the highest number occurring in Latin America, also very high numbers of attacks occurring in Southeast Asia. Some of the most dangerous countries for Defenders include Colombia, Brazil, Honduras, uh, the Philippines, India, and a number of other places. We also see that some groups are, face greater risks than others. I'll specifically mention indigenous peoples who comprise 5% of the world's population, and yet among the uh, attacks that we've tracked, we're subjected to 25% of these attacks. And we've also seen an increase in attacks each year. As you can see from the graphic on your screen, um, in 2019, we saw an increase on attacks since 2018. And when we look at the sectors that are most connected with attacks, we see mining is the sector with the, the most attacks connected to it, followed by agribusiness. And unfortunately, we've also seen a number of attacks related to the renewable energy industry as well, in particular, the hydropower. Next slide, please. Another group of defenders we see facing particular levels of risk are women human rights defenders, as well as LGBTQI defenders, um, which I know Sutari will talk a little bit more about the risks that women human rights defenders face, so I won't go into greater depth on that at this time. Next slide. So at the Resource Center, we also look at the types of attacks, and we cover the full range of attacks that defenders focused on business-related activities face. This includes killings, judicial harassment, including strategic lawsuits against public participation, a range of threats, and other forms of violence. And we found that last year, almost half of the attacks were related to judicial harassment of human rights defenders. Next slide, please. And I'm just going to conclude my comments with a quote from Miriam al Khawaja, a Bahraini human rights defender who was formerly associated with the Gulf Center for Human Rights, who said, if you are going to do business in any country, ask where their human rights defenders are. If you find that they're in prison, that is an economy that you don't want to be a part of. So thank you, and I'll turn it back to you. Uh, Kristen, uh, thank you so much. Uh, the data is telling, and the uh, vulnerable, uh, when we look at the broad scope uh, in terms of various sectors, uh, women, uh, workers that have been made vulnerable by economic systems, et cetera. But I really am so glad that you ended with this quote, because that's a, a clear kind of plumb line, uh, uh, kind of an indicator for a company or investments in companies to whether, where are the human rights defenders? And if they're in prison, that is a serious, uh, serious red flag. Uh, so let's uh, now introduce our next uh, speaker, uh, Surari uh, uh, Wanas, Wanasiri. I hope I get that right, Wanasiri. And to me, uh, 
having you with us is uh, absolutely critical, partly because you're, you're on the front lines and you've experienced a range of uh, issues, particularly some of the, 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 you know, the criminal uh, cases against you and those that you're working with. But you've been a researcher, uh, you've, you've been a human rights advocate for so many years. And who better to describe to us some of the issues related to human rights defenders? So, uh, so through Ari, if you could just uh, let us uh, get a picture of, of what it's, it's like and how we can uh, support. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, David, and thank you to the organizer for uh, inviting me to to join this uh, webinar. And and good uh, good morning and good evening to uh, the audience. Yeah, uh, I apologize. I might slip out some yawning because it's approaching my bedtime here in Bangkok. It's almost like uh, 9 p.m. Uh, but yeah, let's uh, let's start. So um, uh, I would like to share like the experience of working uh, in uh, Thailand and in Southeast Asia uh, the, for demanding a corporate accountability. Next slide, please. So for the situation of the human rights defender in Thailand, um, we are not uh, living in a very tropical and paradise like a uh, um, uh, destination of holidays maker, but uh, as a human rights defender uh, and a citizen of Thailand, at the moment we are living under the state of emergency, uh, and the government have announced the state of emergency and uh, uh, since March this year uh, in responding to the COVID-19, and we have been living under the restriction uh, on the freedom of expression and freedom of assembly and other freedom of movement issue since then. So what happening to uh, like so human rights defender in Thailand uh, like many other human human rights defender that Kristen have provided uh, example we have been facing a uh, physical attack uh, we are facing a uh, criminalization prosecution by civil law or by criminal laws uh, for example, Protection International uh, have documented that at least 59 human rights activists uh, were killed or disappeared in Thailand uh, in the past 20 years. And unfortunately, most of them are unaccountable. So nobody was arrested or bring to justice. Uh, so what we are seeing here is that the authority have failed to protect the human rights defender and also to provide environment that we can work safely. Uh, next slide, please. Um, uh, apart from the prosecution, we have also seen the uh, increasing level of stigmatization. Uh, uh, we have seen both online and offline misinformation and hate speech that were attacking and targeting directly to human rights activists uh, working uh, on the ground or working to advocate for marginal group in the country. For example, we have been labeled as um, anti-development, we have been labeled as a threat to national security, as a foreign spy or even an insurgent. Uh, and this uh, misinformation and um, uh, discriminatory speech and derogatory speech have been undermining our work and our safety. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in addition to uh, the risk that we are facing from the authority in demanding the corporate accountability, uh, in, uh, in the case of business, uh, we have also seen the increasingly uh, level of intimidation and threat, um, uh, particularly for the activists working on land and environmental um, defender. Uh, some company uh, have uh, in use civil and criminal prosecution uh, in an attempt to silence the activists who exposed human rights abuse or uh, environmental impact of the business project. Uh, and usually this human rights abuse or the negative impacts of their business project are a result of a lack of meaningful consultation from affected community and stakeholder from the beginning. So this is the part that I will come back to later in my recommendation. Uh, next slide, please. 
Uh, I would like to share with you some of the example of like who are these people uh, in Thailand. So this is the Southern Peasant Federation of Thailand. Uh, next slide, please. They are a small group of uh, small uh, farmer who have been demanding for land rights and access to land. They are advocating for the fair distribution of resource, uh, particularly uh, land, um, water, uh, in order to be able to live sustainably by growing their own food. Um, so what happened to them? Because the land that they are uh, uh, would like to use are also occupied by a palm oil plantation company. And this uh, and uh, some of the land are also owned by the state. Mm. Um, because of this, they have been facing uh, criminal charge. They have been facing forced eviction. Uh, the three uh, farmer that you see in the photo uh, in front of you here, they are now in jail. They have been in jail uh, and alleged for uh, trespassing of a company land. Uh, and they were sentenced to three years. So this is the reality of what happened to them. Next slide, please. So coming to uh, the issue of uh, women's human rights defender, why we are at a greater risk like, uh, in the society. So women human rights defenders are more vulnerable uh, to intimidation and attacks uh, based on uh, gender and also sexual dimension. Because like one thing is that the work of human right, women human rights defender, uh, they are uh, defying the traditional norms in the society. They are speaking out or they are working outside the house. Uh, and this may be seen as threatening uh, to the uh, traditional uh, value and belief that the uh, value more male leader than women leader. So uh, in this case, like uh, women human rights defender uh, have been facing several type of uh, intimidation and harassment. Um, next slide, please. So uh, women human rights defender uh, have been imprisoned, uh, they have been killed, they have been prosecuted, uh, and they also subject to, uh, for example, all lies, uh, discriminatory uh, uh, message. Um, uh, women human rights defender have also been uh, uh, excluded like socially uh, when they're stepping out to work uh, and uh, sometimes the community member do not have understanding and also view that as um, uh, that they are ignoring the traditional uh, tasks or work that they should have been doing. Uh, so this factor of their vulnerability should be taken into account in order to build a better, stronger mechanism to protect them. So let's see the example of women human rights defender. Next slide, please. Um, Kun uh, Sutasini Kaoleklai, she is a labor rights activist. Um, uh, for, uh, formerly, she was a garment worker in a factory in Thailand. Uh, but after she has been facing persecution and she has been uh, let out from work because she was starting to mobilizing other labor uh, and uh, work and other worker into a union. Uh, she has started to work in order to promote and protect the rights of the worker, uh, particularly women worker and also migrant worker. Mm -hmm. Next slide slide, please. So Kun Sutasini is uh, working at a um, small NGO uh, based in Samusa Khan in Thailand, which is um, very uh, like predominantly uh, uh, a working area for Myanmar uh, worker in the country. Uh, Kun Sutasini is a Thailand project coordinator for Migrant Worker Rights Network. So in her work, she uh, encourage uh, workers to unionize. She also provide trainings uh, on labor rights issue, uh, provide training on collective bargaining and access to remedy for the worker. And mm -hmm. they have been several cases that they have achieved. Uh, but this come also as a prize. Uh, Kun Sutasini received direct threats um, from government officer, from the broker, and from the company. Currently, she is facing multiple criminal lawsuits uh, brought by the business uh, for her role in supporting migrant worker to access to justice. Next slide, please. Mm 
So this is the case that I'm going to uh, share with you. Um, so the Thai power tree company uh, uh, has been uh, using the tactic called judicial harassment, or in um, an, a more uh, academic term, they call it um, a slap lawsuit or a strategic litigation against public participation. So since 2016, a Thai power tree company named Tamakaset, uh, which supply a power tree meat to better grow uh, has filed a total of 39 criminal and civil cases against 23 defendants, including eight human rights defenders, 14 workers uh, for uh, their, their role in exposing the labor rights uh, violation that took place in their farm. Next slide, please. So the case start um, back when the uh, 14 migrant worker from Myanmar submit their complaints about labor right violation to the Thai authority and the Thai court actually award them a compensation uh, because the Thai court found that the company uh, have violated the labor rights including uh, paying the worker under the minimum wage and underpaid overtime and holidays. Uh, uh, and um, in another issue that we have found is also the confiscation of the identity document. Um, next slide, please. So um, instead of um, providing this remedy uh, to the worker, the company have started to uh, retaliate by using a criminal lawsuit uh, against the worker. The worker have been charged with defamation uh, and uh, have been uh, going through the lawsuit for several years. And in those um, years, I have also started to work in documenting uh, this uh, judicial harassment uh, and also advocate for the government and for the business to drop this case. Uh, as a result, like I myself have also uh, been charged um, for criminal uh, defamation uh, and civil defamation by this company. In total, I have three cases against myself and uh, um, one of the cases uh, has now uh, reached the first court and uh, I, I have been acquitted. But I just received the news from my lawyer today that um, uh, the company appealed the decision. So it would take us um, probably now six more months or one year to know the result of the appeal. But uh, what is more worrying is actually the case of Kun Sutas uh, Kun Sushani Kwaiter, a Thai journalist who also report on the labor rights abuse uh, uh, by this by the company on her Twitter. She was also charged with defamation and she was sentenced to two years years in jail um, uh, for for her Twitter uh, and uh, currently she is now released on bail. Next slide please. So what are the impact of this lawsuit? Uh, um, it is clearly uh, to, uh, it's demand the time and financial resource uh, in order to find a quality legal representation to defend the case in the court. And it's the, definitely it's not easy, especially if you are migrant worker. The migrant worker have also been facing the lawsuit and there was also require like translation interpretation in order to understand the process and be able to access the fair trial. Uh, and the other issue, next slide please, is also actually affects on freedom of expression. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, because of the fear of this lawsuit, uh, many activists and journalists are avoiding to report or document it about this case uh, because they think that they could be the next target. Uh, so so this is clearly uh, creating a climate of fear uh, um, for reporting on human rights abuse. Next slide, please. And the third uh, issue that we have seen that is very, uh, to me, is very um, uh, discouraging is also this is the tactic to shift the focus from a human rights abuse as a structural level or at industry level and divert that attention to the lawsuit. So like uh, in Thailand, agricultural business uh, still have a lot of gaps in terms of the domestic practice and internationally accepted labor rights and human 
human rights standard. But uh, this uh, issue have not been uh, uh, significantly addressed because a lot of attention have been now focusing on the lawsuit. Uh, and we still, for example, have the law that prevents migrant worker from uh, establish their own trade unions. And this have been called for more than 10 years. So these are some of the issues that uh, I think I would like to share. Um, David, do I still have time? Or... Oh, you have uh, plenty of time, about a minute and a half. Okay, that would be enough. So uh, next slide, please. So um, I would like to share uh, the uh, recommendation uh, that I think would be helpful, um, mm -hmm. for, for example, for um, for the government and also for the business. Uh, I think for the government, um, some of our colleagues could be also elaborate on that. So I would like to focus on the recommendation for the business here. Um, mm -hmm. Could you uh, go to the next slide? Yes, thank you. So for the business, I think like first and foremost we could start with the uh, uh, stop uh, using this legal proceeding and this lawsuit uh, uh, to intimidate or to prosecute that human rights defender um, because uh, what we are doing is also uh, we are not attacking or like the uh, damaging the business we are actually trying to help bringing more transparency and accountability and um, to the business which can in fact actually uh, if they see as a corporation uh, this will be the way to work forward together to achieve a better uh, standard of living a better working condition and even uh, a better economic opportunity for the business themselves so I think this is one thing that I would like to stress out. Another issue that I think uh, is also um, uh, is important for the business to recognize if they have violated human rights and provide uh, adequate and effective remedy for the people whose human rights have been violated. For example, the workers or human rights defender or like uh, any other groups and community that have been affected by the business uh, operation. Mm -hmm. And lastly, I think that I would like to share um, is the um, the uh, information uh, that it would be good for the business to public the information uh, about uh, their supply chain, the shareholder, the employment policy and condition, and also the uh, complaint mechanism to ensure that there, there are transparency and they are willing to collaborate and listen to the stakeholder. So I think uh, I will stop for now. Thank you very much. Suthuri, we uh, thank you so much. Uh, you don't look like it's late in the evening. Your your energy and your passion for this work is it comes through uh, this platform, and I'm sure the people that you're working with. It's just shocking that there's so much focus that needs to happen to get a measure of justice, whether it's in land, like in the in the south, or whether it's migrant workers. Uh, but any of the suits that you're facing and others are facing. Uh, just distract. It takes so much time uh, away from uh, the work. And I think uh, companies and investors need to understand the role in which they can intercede. Because you think of all the multinational companies that are in your country uh, from many, many different sectors, from the ICT, the apparel, the food, et cetera, seafood. So we really have a responsibility knowing what we know that you've described uh, to really look at how then we can be effective in, in support and uh, protection. So next we're going to be going to uh, Sarah Brooks. Uh, we had another speaker, uh, Ali Hines from uh, Global Witness. Uh, Global Witness has been a tremendous ally in this work for, for so long. Um, but uh, Sarah, we've asked you to cover a number of things, including some of the due diligence related to companies, some of the international law framework. What's the cost if they're, you know, if human rights defenders aren't uh, protected and defended? And uh, Sarah comes from the, she's a Brussels liaison at human rights advocate at the International Service uh, for Human Rights, another core institution that's working on advocacy and, and support. Uh, around corporate accountability to pr protect land rights, to protect the environment, to protect workers. So, Sarah, thanks so much. Of course, um, and, and thanks to all of you for joining.
Um, it's a real pleasure to go after Kristen and Sutari because they've laid out quite a lot of what it looks like on the ground as a defender um, confronting human rights violations and trying to find accountability um, and, and to ensure that those who are responsible are, um, are brought to justice. Um, I'm gonna take us a step way, way back um, and look at what are the international human rights frameworks mm -hmm. that sort of give us this idea of what is a human rights defender and what protections um, are they entitled to, then dive a little bit deeper into what are sort of the normative frameworks or expectations on business when it comes to human rights defenders. Um, and some of those I think are quite well established and as we'll go forward, some are, are emerging um, and I think are, are very much a sort of substance of discussions like this. Uh, and then finally, I'll speak a little bit about um, the costs of inaction or the costs of ignoring the role that defenders can play um, and what implications this might have for investors. Um, so the definition that we got from Suthari and from Kristen at the very, the very beginning of defenders as individuals who are defined not by their occupation, but by what they do and to support the promotion and protection of human rights is the definition that the UN itself uses. In 1998, the UN General Assembly agreed and adopted um, a declaration on blah, 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 but what we now call a declaration on human rights defenders. Um, it's often contested in the spaces of the UN in New York and Geneva, but it's a common reference point and it's one that's made its way eventually into binding international law. Um, so for example, when we think of defenders uh, not as operating in isolation from human rights issues, not simply as exercising rights, but as exercising rights in order to see the realization of other rights, mm -hmm. um, we see them as enabling or facilitators. Uh, we see how defenders and the environments in which they can thrive are central to the realization of rights, for example, of migrant workers or women or children or the abolition of, of torture, right? So there's, there's a connectedness and a, um, a facilitating role that defenders play that's recognized in, therefore, all of the other international conventions which make up this uh, sort of human rights law framework. Um, I think it's helpful, you know, not just to focus though on the human rights arena. In development, we see that the SDGs intersect um, a lot with human rights and also with human rights defenders, thinking of goal eight on decent work or goal 16 on just societies, um, but also thinking about how civil society plays a role as a facilitator appears in, for example, SDG 10 on inequality or SDG 13 on climate change. Just very quickly to wrap up the international side, um, peace and security, yep, also helped when we have defenders who are empowered and able to act. Um, and the Security Council has discussed this in the context of women's rights and peace building, um, and has talked about the way in which defenders and attacks on defenders are a bit the canary in the coal mine. We can see attacks on defenders as one step down the path towards human rights violations or atrocity, and therefore as a major signifier for the need to act. Now, if we think about that as sort of our, our framework for states, what then do businesses need to do? Um, and I think it's really helpful to think of, first of all, how businesses may be connected, and then second of all, how the frameworks we have um, actually outline what businesses should therefore do. The company can cause an adverse impact through its own actions or its failure to act on human rights defenders. So this could, for example, be um, dismissing a, a unionist, right? Or it could be uh, moving forward with a development project without having the consent of the community. A company may also contribute to adverse impact um, either in parallel with its partners on the ground or with a government where it's operating um, or through external entities such as its suppliers, its users, or its customers. 
And then finally, a company's products, services, or operations can be directly linked to adverse impacts on defenders through a business relationship. Due diligence um, is the means by which companies can identify these risks. And due diligence processes increasingly recognize a role not only for defenders in providing critical information about the on-the-ground situation in ensuring that the due diligence the company carries out is well-informed, but also as a substantive part of that process of ensuring that the actions of companies and states do not restrict or impair or interfere with the work of human rights defenders. Um, I just very quickly say, you know, in the introduction to the guiding principles, um, it states that they should be implemented in a non-discriminatory way and paying attention to the challenges faced by populations that may be at heightened risk of vulnerability or marginalization. And I think the cases that we've heard both specific to Thailand and the more broad global scope that Kristen's given us really do um, support the argument that defenders are those marginalized or vulnerable groups in this case. Um, so the GPs consider that attacks on defenders um, are a human rights risk that companies should identify and to mitigate. Um, but also that, you know, I think if we take it one step further, thinking about how there's a discussion about the role of companies in identifying and mitigating contexts where defenders are being attacked as part of their overall human rights due diligence and impact assessments, but where there might not be a direct connection. When companies fail to appreciate the role of defenders, what can happen? What are the costs? Um, in some cases, we've seen these be operational costs. So for example, um, extensive delays in delivery or excessive transport costs. I'm um, thinking of Freeport, Freeport McMoran and Copper Mine in Indonesia. There could be reputational risks leading to a decline in stock values. There could be issues with employee satisfaction and retention. Um, and there's a, a case of um, the Google Dragonfly project that I think is a very telling uh, example. Um, but I don't want to focus too much on, on kind of the costs to companies because I think there's a flip side of this, which is what are companies already starting to think through and do right? Um, and that's maybe where I'll wrap it up and, and kind of have David step in to talk then about the role of investors. Um, in the investor guidance that we prepared and building up to what can investors do on the issue of human rights defenders, we did spend a fair amount of time talking about how companies should be taking action. Um, the first of those is that companies should have human rights policies that are aligned with the guiding principles mm -hmm. um, and that communicate the expectations across the value chain. Um, so one example for it is Adidas, who has a standalone policy on human rights defenders. Um, I think we see this more broadly when we look at the corporate human rights benchmark. How are human rights defenders being addressed throughout human rights policies, whether standalone, as in the case of Adidas, or integrated? The second uh, recommendation is for portfolio companies to identify, mitigate, and account for how they address adverse human rights impacts. Um, so when we talk about identifying risk, it's both, um, I think, very narrow and increasingly with a broader lens, a wide, taking the approach of using a wider scope of resources, for example, to really understand what risk means when we talk about human rights defenders. Um, it might not simply be, um, you know, uh, blatant attacks by law enforcement. It might be something like a restrictive NGO law. Um, and maybe broadening our view a little bit gives us a much more nuanced sense of um, how risk operates. Um, and then finally, in terms of how, how things are moving forward, um, I think we're seeing an increasing number of companies who are speaking out or who are pursuing a more constructive engagement policy. Um, so in 2018, a number of companies, as well as the Investor Alliance, signed a statement affirming the crucial role of defenders um, and committing to protection of civic freedoms. 
similar configurations of companies, MSIs, and civil society have engaged on issues like a crackdown on protesters in Cambodia, on the drug war and attacks on human rights defenders in the Philippines, on um, the arrest of journalists and limits on independent media in Angola. Uh, but being a vocal and public voice um, is, I think, a, a really new um, and very sort of interesting change that we've seen from companies and one that's highly aligned with uh, the idea of acting in support of defenders. Um, and finally, we see companies who are providing financial or in-kind support um, to human rights defenders across the spectrum. Um, just very recently, Microsoft took action to protect healthcare workers um, in response to increased online threats and hacking uh, during the time of COVID. Microsoft made threat detection software available for free um, to those working in the healthcare sector, but also those in human rights and humanitarian who are helping to support an ongoing response, as well as a rights-based um, uh, conclusion, I guess, right, rights-based policies to get out of uh, the current climate. So maybe that's enough on companies. Um, David, what, what about investors? Well, uh, thanks so much, uh, Sarah. I think partly it's a question of getting from the international legal uh, standards to some of your examples just now about what companies can be doing. Um, so next slide, please. Uh, for This is going to be a very brief uh, sort of presentation, and I encourage you to go to the Investor Alliance website to uh, if you haven't, to download, you know, this this document, uh, Safeguarding uh, Human Rights Defenders, because there's a lot more information in there. And I'd also refer to uh, another uh, really excellent uh, resource that came out in May from the Alliance, uh, the Investor Toolkit. Uh, but I'd like to just highlight a, a few things uh, before turning it over to, um, you know, to uh, Corey that is going to kind of look at one specific uh investor institution and how they're approaching it. I think, you know, just at a higher level, I mean, COVID-19 has, has really laid bare the urgent need to build just, equitable, and human rights-centered uh, systems and institutions, behaviors for all stakeholders, including, as we've heard, companies, governments, and uh, investors. Uh, secondly, we're, we're not in a... Uh, sort of a stable environment. We are in an environment where human rights defenders are increasingly under attack. Uh, Suthari, you really nailed that in terms of the lawsuits, the civil lawsuits, the criminal lawsuits that are attacking, uh, you know, indispensable work that is being done on the ground that really benefits rule of law, benefits companies, benefits uh, a variety of stakeholders. And then third, the challenge really more institutional investors should understand and embed uh, their responsibility to respect human rights as defined by the UNGPs. And you've uh, you know outlined uh, Sarah so well, because here it's a question of sometimes it's easier for for inv institutional investors to uh, scrutinize their portfolio companies in terms of their responsibilities. But I think it's turning back on the investor community what uh, what its responsibilities are. Next slide. So in the the guidance uh, document, we have a, a number of sort of the the scale and the sort of the movement from before you invest, during the investment process, uh, et cetera, through the whole the whole life cycle of investment. Uh, but here, in terms of just pointing to very quickly the very things. Sarah, that you were describing in terms of human rights due diligence around companies uh, is the framework for the investor uh, responsibility uh, to respect human rights. So adopt policies, embed them throughout the institution, not just in a, a silo within, um, within a, uh, a institution that is not sort of taking it in terms of who really makes the decisions around investment, uh, need to be a, very much involved. And I think the, the embed embedding of that commitment across the entire institution, much like we're asking companies to embed, not in a CSR program, but in the entire uh, 
uh, business, uh, the business model. And then I think also it's really important to communicate human rights expectations, um, actual potential investee companies uh, between asset owners uh, who then will be hiring asset managers. So what are the human rights criteria that they're using based on the UNGPs? And then of course the asset managers in terms of how they're investing and making sure that the social analysts and the those that are making the decisions, uh, uh, you know, are in sync in terms of their their responsibility to respect human rights and specifically human rights defenders. Next slide, please. So, in terms of the investment investment decision, I think the asset owners, you know. Uh, need to assess the human rights commitment of the potential asset managers. And this is a iterative process, but I think it's beginning to take hold and we have a number of institutions that are now doing this. Uh, asset managers need to look at, you know, the human rights policies, the due diligence processes, all that you described, Sarah, in terms of making the decision uh, about investing in a particular, uh, a particular company. I do think we need to note that, and the guide does this as well, that a lot of the ESG providers often aren't really hitting the nail on human rights performance and analysis and measurement. So investors need to be attentive to the ESG providers that to, to really up their understanding of what the information is related to human rights defenders, how it really enables uh, an investor to look at concrete uh, abuses and violations and how are they being remedied. Uh, so that's a real job that needs to still happen. And I think, you know, we obviously really need to look uh, as the investor community to some of the resources that are really on this, uh, on this webinar with the Resource Center, the Corporate Human Rights Benchmark, the UN Guiding Principles Reporting Framework, and so much rich information from UN independent human rights uh, experts that are, is there that can enable investors and companies to get this right. Next slide. And then finally, as we're going through the responsible investment uh, stewardship cycle, it's really identifying the throughout the investment portfolio. Uh, what are some of the potential and actual uh, impacts that are taking place? And engage portfolio companies to improve the human rights risk. It could be through shareholder resolutions where that's relevant and possible. It could be participation in getting companies to participate in collective action. Can you imagine you know, some of the collective action that needs to take place in Thailand in order to really ad address the systemic issues that make uh, it very difficult for land holders or should they should have that holding uh, of, of the land and yet could be evicted because of a plantation. So I think we need to, uh, you know, join with other investors. Uh, you know, there's some great examples uh, over the last several years of the Investor Alliance looking at uh, opportunities where investors can come together and make public statements uh, related to a whole range of uh, issues including protecting human rights defenders, as was the case in April of 2018 with a really excellent uh, statement that really focused on some of the huge violations and attacks of indigenous rights defenders in uh, the Philippines. So now I'm going to pass the uh, baton, baton to Corey, to, and Corey has been at Domini since 2018, prior to that at the American you know, AFL-CIO with the Office of Investment, so has a, a real background on the investment community as well as some of the uh, civil society and trade union issues. Corey. So you're, you need to be unmuted. Yep, there we go, thank you. Okay. Um, and thanks so much to everyone for having me today. Thanks to the other speakers. This is really an incredible panel. Um, I know a lot of folks in the ICCR community have been leaving on these issues for longer than I've been around. So thank you to all of you also. Uh, Domini has been doing this work for a long time. So I, I hope I can just 
speak to some of our experience in this space that, in a way that might be useful for other investors on the line. Uh, I think the why has been made clear by the other panelists, but uh, I'll just say that the connections to these kinds of abuses can lead to material risks for companies, be they reputational risk, le legal, operational, or otherwise. And beyond that, I think, as Sarah said, these risks uh, or, or human rights defenders are kind of the canary in the coal mine. Where you see uh, human rights defenders treated badly, that's an early warning sign that there are really serious risks in these companies' uh, operations, supply chains, or just the jurisdictions where they may operate. Rule of law is essential to predicting to a uh, predictable and stable capital market, and that's a prerequisite for a good investment environment. So um, I think for so many reasons, this is a really, really key indicator of business and investing risk, in addition to human rights risk. Um, but mostly I'm going to focus my comments on the how Domini has put this into action. Uh, just very briefly, for folks who are not familiar with Domini, we've been doing ESG investing since the 90s. And we talk about our three tools for impact. First are our standards, where, which guide our uh, research and investment criteria. Uh, second is community investing, which is how we proactively allocate capital to projects we believe are part of the solution. And then finally, engagement with companies, the financial community, policymakers, and other stakeholders, which is my job. And as David said, I came out of the uh, U.S. labor movement. So I definitely have some experience in the importance of freedom of association. Mm -hmm. um, can we go to the next slide, please? I'm sure everyone has closely studied the UN guiding principles, but just I thought I would quickly go through because it's helpful for me to remind myself too. As investors, we're usually directly linked to the companies that we invest in, which in turn may cause, contribute to, or be directly linked to adverse impacts. Uh, and then if you can go to the next slide. So then as investors, we are, uh, the guiding principles indicate that we should use our leverage to mitigate the risk of impact continuing or uh, recurring and consider playing a role in enabling remediation of the harm. And so we try to fulfill these responsibilities with three things primarily, I would say. The first is our research process, which often keeps us out of this kind of issue in the first place. And then we use our proxy voting and our engagement work. Uh, can you go to the next slide? Thank you. So. Just quickly, um, our research process, and this is where other firms may rely on um, an outside ESG provider. And since we do this all in-house, we have more control and flexibility to address the issues we think are important. Um, Domini has two core pillars, universal human dignity and ecological sustainability, and that's kind of where our standards begin. And from there, we develop um, down to sub-industry specific KPIs, uh, how we look at ESG issues in specific companies. Um, so first off, like I mentioned, we our research process screens out most of the uh, highest risk companies and industries. We have pretty much no exposure to oil and gas or extractives, and uh, we've avoided certain geographies based on um, investment uh, or human rights risks in certain countries and, and places. And the securities that we do hold have to go through our ESG research process, like I mentioned, and they are subject to these KPIs that are specific at the sub-industry level that explicitly address a number of stakeholder impacts. Um, and then finally, we would screen, we would, uh, the research process would look at any controversies. So a negative interaction with human rights defenders would, of course, weigh heavily against the company. Um, on the other hand, something like Tiffany and company speaking out against the arrest of a human rights defender in Angola is a highly positive uh, indicator. And can you go to the next slide? So David mentioned doing David mentioned doing this in a structured way, building it into the um, the structure of the company. I'm getting a little bit of an echo from someone. Not sure uh, where that's coming from, but uh, proxy voting guidelines are one way to do this. This is a way that we signal to the market. In addition to our standards, which you can see on our website, our proxy voting guidelines. Um, our signal to the market about how we look at some of these issues. They're a really important tool for equity investors, and they're often underutilized. Uh, I just pulled a few quotes here. Um, human rights defenders don't often explicitly appear on proxy statements, but it can happen. And here's just a few ways that we try to um, call out uh, 
shareholder proposals that we'll support or vote on based on uh, things connected to human rights uh, issues and human rights defenders in particular. The other thing is that proxy voting, you get to vote on directors, and that is arguably more important anyway. If the board has failed to effectively oversee human rights related risks, voting against a director is a way to hold them accountable. Um, so you can see more, and we do have ESG related uh, in the, um, proxy voting guidelines for director elections. And so you're welcome to look at our website to look at these more closely, or I encourage you to just think about how you might develop them for yourself as well. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? So the last piece is engagement, and that's really where I come in and where a lot of this work ends up happening. I'm going to actually start with the second bullet point here. Um, and give you an example. So uh, I think everyone's familiar with the human rights risks in Myanmar that have been especially significant in recent years. Um, we're aware of that. And we also knew that at the height of those risks, Japanese direct investment into Myanmar was growing. Uh, and so we engaged with all of the Japanese companies in our portfolio to address their exposure in Myanmar and to also find out what they were doing to manage it. And specifically, we were looking at what was their due diligence process, how were they using it, um, and whether it was aligned with UN guiding principles. Um, some had really robust uh, guiding, uh, due diligence in place and a lot did not. Um, and so this led to a kind of uh, ongoing conversation where we shared back with them best practices, what their peers were doing, and what would make their due diligence process more effective. So both we lay out the business case and then we explain why the best practices are what we're aiming for. And so, for instance, if you had a really good due diligence process, but you only did it after you started your investment in the place, you kind of expose yourself to the risk and you're not getting the full benefit of your due diligence work. Um, so that's kind of like a, a broad, like without us knowing specifically that this company sourced from this company that did this thing, we just know that the risk exists. And so we engage proactively to look at how these companies were addressing the risk and what they were doing to uh, mitigate it and uh, remediate harm when it had occurred. Um, then on specific controversies, <laughs> long before I uh, joined Domini, um, the firm had engaged with Coca-Cola over bottlers in Colombia. And I think folks may remember this case, so it's probably 20 some odd years ago. Um, if you remember it, the worker leaders at the bottlers were actually being assassinated and organizers were getting death threats from paramilitary groups and the lawsuit they filed was dismissed on procedural grounds. And so through our engagements with Coke, we um, worked with them to understand their, um, they introduced, a hum introduced human rights guidelines um, for their bottlers and they even went so far as to provide workers with cell phones and a hotline to uh, report abuse. And this is actually even before the guiding principles were published. Um, but, you know, we were looking for both prevention and remediation from the company. Um, and I use this example because when our staff looked back at Coca-Cola's response, it actually came up as inadequate for a few reasons, including that the wrong people were answering the hotline, and so they didn't get any complaints. Um, but also, more importantly, because the supplier code of conduct isn't binding. And I think that comes up a lot in um, companies kind of try to get a pass and say, look, we, we have this in our code of conduct. We say that there shouldn't be any forced labor in the supply chain. Those aren't binding commitments, and they're not um, contractual commitments with the suppliers which we know is possible. And so um, then we, pro so the last thing I'm gonna point out is that we proactively communicate our expectations around um, working with human rights defenders and labor groups. Um, and in particular, recent work that we've done through the Investor Alliance and ICCR with the Coalition of Immokalee Workers especially, uh, their fair food program has been so successful because in part it creates contractually binding terms for the brands at the consumer end of the supply chain. So um, while uh, we don't invest in a lot of the companies that are directly involved in, let's say, the really serious human rights ab abuses in the agricultural supply chain, we do invest in the brands that are the consumer facing companies at the end of the supply, you know, the user end of the supply chain. And so um, and having them adopt contractual commitments to sourcing their, in this case, tomatoes with 
from specific farms that meet specific requirements. And incidentally, the part of those requirements include a hotline that's run by workers. So, you know, workers are able to actually feel safe calling. Um, that that actually has been shown to have real human rights benefits uh, and and protections for the frontline human rights defenders in those spaces. So um, there is a, a model contract clause that I think the American Bar Association just uh, published and, and uh, certified or, or what have you um, that we're going to look at as a potential model to use when we're engaging companies. Um, and, and we did work with others in this community to um, push Wendy's to join the Fair Foods program um, as another way to kind of operationalize this, this evolved theory of change um, to protect defenders. So, um, yeah, anyway, so I, I, I hope some of those examples are useful, and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions if, if they're out there. Thanks. David, you're muted. So we have about 15 minutes for questions and we have such a wide range of issues to address. Uh, one, you know, that is very pertinent, uh, you know, what are the panelists' thoughts on today's news that despite the Thai uh, Supreme Court's dismissal of the case against Andy Hall, person that we've worked with a lot over the years, there's another Thai company that is now suing him for defamation again. Uh, Sathari, do you want to start? And then we could uh, get comments from others as well. You need to be unmuted. Okay, yeah, I think it's working now, sorry. Okay. Um, so yeah, what I'd like to share, like, uh, that uh, there are both some uh, positive and negative example happening. Uh, and for example, in the case of Thailand, uh, the, although the Thai government take a positive step to adopt the first like national uh, human rights, like a national plan on business and human rights, uh, and specifically mention about the protection for human rights defender by preventing uh, these judicial harassment and uh, unwarranted lawsuit against them uh, through uh, adopting a new uh, like criminal procedure uh, in order to allow the, the judge uh, to dismiss this case from the very beginning. Um, unfortunately, it's, uh, although it has been uh, amended for almost two years, um, we have not seen any cases that the judge uh, has used uh, this provision in order to stop uh, this uh, lawsuit and this is also why we have seen uh, recurring uh, um, attempts uh, to use the judicial harassment also in uh, Andy case as well like uh, Andy case uh, has also uh, one of the most um, like significant case uh, in the sense that the level of uh, um, intimidation and harassment that really undermining um, personal like effort and uh, um, the ability to work to support the, the migrant workers. So uh, this is one of, of the issue that we have seen. Another uh, thing that I would like to add is that um, I actually would like to acknowledge that uh, I'm one of the privileged activists that is able to uh, access to this platform, uh, able to speak English. I live in a big city, uh, mm -hmm. while the majority of human rights defenders living uh, in remote area they are land uh, environmental defender they are indigenous people groups um, uh, they might not have the same access and level of um, public exposure that will protecting them so I think uh, what would be very helpful when we are thinking about the protection strategy for the human rights defender is that uh, you have to do it in a way that is also uh, incorporate them into their community uh, but not isolating them or alienating them from from their community I think like uh, it's very important in in the term of the protection thank you <laughs> 
Great, thank you. Another question, this is Stephen Berry's. Uh, how often are tax directly attributable to a company? And then what is the best way for investors to monitor this? Anyone want to take that? I'm happy to respond. Um, I think, you know, there are a few rare cases where um, companies are directly, like you can directly link the brand that we as a U.S. equity investor might invest in to a specific action. Like, and, but I feel like those are the most headline cases where you're going to see a lot of these reputational risks manifest. And by the time that happens, you're too, you're too late. You know, really, you want to look at um, the operating environment, like what are the due diligence processes they have in place before you find out that this company is specifically responsible for state-sponsored murder, you know? What are they doing with their due diligence beforehand? What is their what is their relationship to their suppliers look like? What does the environment on the ground look like? And those are the kind of preventative questions that I think help keep you away from, uh, keep you out of the harm in the first place, and then also have a much more, um, be much more prepared in case a harm does occur. You know that these are the processes in place. You can figure out where it broke down, assess, improve, and and try to remediate. Mm -hmm. So I would just say that not not to hold out for those examples where it's really, really so explicit. There's a lot to be done before then. Thank you so much. Uh, a question from Frank Sherman to Sarah. Oh, uh, Kristen, you want to comment? Yes. Briefly speak to that following Corey's comments, just to say, you know, in our tracking of attacks against human rights defenders, it can be difficult to see a clear business link. Um, I should also mention that, you know, the tracking that we do is based on publicly available information, and many of these attacks happen in secret. So we know the number is much higher than the 2,400 we've tracked since 2015 of defenders focused on business. So it can be difficult to ascertain that information. And at the same time, having relationships with local human rights organizations that are tracking attacks, regional organizations that are monitoring the specific context um, can definitely be beneficial. And I'll say to respond to the point on SLAPs, I just want to point out that this is also a global phenomenon. We are seeing companies use strategic litigation as a means to silence critics and to silence defenders. We see it here in the United States where I'm based, where Protect the Protest Task Force has been mobilizing and working on this. We see this in every region of the world. And at the Resource Center right now, we're working on in-depth research to really understand the true scope and landscape of the use of SLAPs uh, yeah. in collaboration with a number of partners. Boy, thanks so much for that, Kristen. And uh, again, anyone interested in getting more information can go to the website or contact you. Uh, Sarah, question, uh, what was the controversy surrounding the UN Declaration? Why haven't more countries adopted these international laws? So uh, as with most things, um, the UN controversy is actually much less interesting than it sounds like on the surface. Um, <laughs> But uh, in, in a nutshell, there was a disagreement um, about the use of the term human rights defender. Um, and uh, that was rooted in a sense that on the one hand, and um, actually I think this might sound familiar to some of, some of you who have engaged um, with portfolio companies, for example, um, it may be based in a belief that defenders don't deserve extra protections. Right. This is not about a specific set of rights. Um, and we would agree it's not. But it's recognizing that people who do the work of protecting and promoting human rights are in positions that are more vulnerable to violations of their human rights, which are the same rights we all have. Um, so it's much more about position. Uh, why have there not been more countries that have adopted legislation? Um, there's a, a surprising number, um, a handful in each region maybe that have. Um, so most recently, I think it was Mali in Africa, Cote d'Ivoire has a standing law. Mm -hmm. um, there, there are legal systems um, and uh, laws that have been adopted specifically to discuss what does it look like when you take this international thing and actually 
make it apply in a domestic context. Um, often those are paired with mechanisms, for example, something part of an interministerial committee, something linked to a National Human Rights Commission, um, which focus on outreach and on monitoring and in trying to kind of get information about the situation of defenders. Um, but I think some of the, the challenges, again, are this idea that we're talking about special rights as opposed to steps that need to be taken to ensure the same rights for anyone, no matter what their, you know, what kind of role they have. Um, there's also, I think, a worrying trend in, and this should sound very familiar, in laws that move us further away from an enabling environment for human rights defender, defenders, mm -hmm. that criminalize free speech, that are, as Christian was saying, um, not preventing the abuse of strategic litigation uh, to limit public participation, things like that. Okay. Um, okay. There's, there's a, some countries, but um, I think largely it, it's not enough. Well, thanks, Sarah. We have uh, probably time for one more question. Uh, Isabel Burns, you have raised your hand. Uh, uh, if she could be unmuted, uh, ask her question. Isabella, you can go ahead. I've unmuted you. Um, maybe in, uh, Isabella doesn't seem to be able to do that, but uh, we have Usman Malik. Maybe we can um, take a question from him instead. Okay. And unfortunately, this will be the last one. Yeah. Usman? I've unmuted you. Hi. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Great. Uh, so this question anybody can take. Um, could uh, we have, or is there, to your knowledge, any global sort of initiative that can be perhaps funded by the Investor Alliance that can provide legal cover or protection to human rights defenders against judicial harassment by these companies? especially in areas that are that have undocumented economies where there's more of a risk in abuses in supply chain. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Uh, who would like to respond briefly? So I can I can step in very briefly and um, just the answer is yes, there are a number of um, NGOs and coalitions of NGOs that are looking at judicial harassment against defenders overall and about um, judicial harassment targeting defenders working in the area of business and human rights. Um, and the Business and Human Rights Resource Center is, is a part of some of those. Um, but I think the, there's sort of a, a question about how to go from monitoring and engaging in advocacy to actually creating the change in the situation um, and in the actions of a state on the ground. Okay, thank you. Uh, other questions that we've gotten in the uh, in the chat box, we will assign to uh, some of the panelists and get back to you. Um, but as we uh, close, next slide, please. Uh, a cup, just a quick word from you, uh, Suthari, about uh, you know what are what are the best questions that you think? Maybe one or two. Uh, that the investor community uh, re really needs to be attentive to in this area of supporting human rights defenders. Um, sure, yeah. Uh, so I think like, I would like to answer the first question about the in, um, like, uh, what should we expect from investor community. I think like first thing is also um, to go back and also like uh, conduct um, human rights due diligence into uh, the company that you are investing in or you planning to investing in about their uh, labor rights record and their human rights records like um and there are several other like resource and organizations that are willing to support and help the, you in doing this and i think that, that that would be a great start um because one you can identify if there are risks and is there um problem then we can start to to address uh, that problem as well so i think uh, I think this is would be one of my asks. 
Excellent. Well, thanks so much. And then just a quick uh, response to next steps for the Investor Alliance uh, on Human Rights Defenders. Uh, we will be organizing, along with a number of you, uh, a webinar probably in September with the Zero Tolerance Initiative, which is a remarkable kind of global coalition led by indigenous uh, communities and peoples, local communities, and some supportive NGOs that, including some of these organizations, that is really get, trying to get to the heart of what's what's the the fundamental risk that's creating uh, situations where there's so many killings and violence against. Uh, human rights defenders linked to global supply chains. So uh, the Zero Tolerance Initiative, uh, along with uh, Global Witness, uh, Ali, who is unfortunately sick today, uh, will be a part of that. So stay tuned. We'll be announcing uh, the dates once we get them. Uh, but first, I want to thank each one of the panelists uh, for being here, Suthari, Kristen, Sarah, uh, Corey, uh, just an amazing amount of information and a lot of commitment to this issue. So we can take as the investor community a serious uh, call uh, from each one of you that we need to do a lot more in integrating into the investment institutions and decision making and ongoing uh, engagements with companies, the uh, human rights due diligence that has a very specific role when it's protection and uh, of uh, human rights defenders that that are good for societies, that are good for the uh, the companies in the end, that are good for investors, and good as we're trying to build a better uh, a better economic system post COVID to really address what is going to be sustainable um, and equitable for each each one of us. So thank you very much. Uh, thanks to the audience for uh, being a part of this conversation, and we will be moving to uh, get some dates on the calendar and let you know uh, how we're going to move this forward. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.